As I was thinking through this text uh, a few days ago, I remembered a story that um, I think it was on Facebook or on a blog that I read. Um, I think it's kind of funny. Maybe it's because I'm a pastor. You might think it's cheesy. But there was a guy that was shipwrecked on an island, um, and he was there alone by himself for five years. And after five years, a crew came out and found him and rescued him. And he was by himself. And so the crew comes out, and there's three huts that were there. And so they're curious, like, what are these three huts? And the guy goes, the one in the middle, that's where I, use, that's where I live. And he goes, okay, that makes sense. And then he goes, what's the one on the left? He goes, that's where I go to worship. Okay, that makes sense. What's the one on the right? He goes, that's where I used to go to worship. <laughs> Give it a second. Some of you guys will get it halfway through the sermon. Um, it'll, it'll hit you then. But, you know, we desire harmony in relationships. And yet, often in Christian churches, in homes, it's constantly frequented by conflict. All we hear is division and strife. And what makes it challenging is that oftentimes Christians, we put on a spiritual face on to make it look like we're in our conflict. We're either defending the truth or standing for what's right. And yet what the world sees is a group of people who just can't seem to get along at all. Increasingly, in the day of social media, you hear stories of churches that are torn apart because of controversy. News of troubles in congregation spreads through social medias and blogs and anonymous emails. And while technology may be new, church conflict is about as old as the early church days. We talk, we talk about the good old days in our country um, or in our family, or the good old days of the church. And in church, you'll often hear things like, man, I wish we were living in the first century church, because in that church, there was, it was dynamic, it was powerful, everyone got along so well. But the reality was the early church was made up of people. And people back then are pretty much like people now. You know, most of the New Testament letters were written to churches that were in conflict. The Corinthian church was a mess. The church in Philippi had two women that couldn't get along with each other, and it was so severe that Paul had to call them out by name. The Galatian church had members who were devouring each other, attacking each other. An entire section to, of the letter that Paul writes to the church in Ephesus is an appeal for unity, for tolerance, for love in the church body. On a personal level, Paul and Barnabas has a conflict so big that they go separate ways and don't talk to each other for years the early church had a hard time getting along. Christians were having trouble in their local churches from right from the beginning. And in our section this morning in James, James is writing to a group of people and addressing the problems of quarreling and strife and conflict. So would you read with me James 3, 13 through 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. That is not the wisdom that comes from above, but it's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. In essence, what James is communicating to us this morning is that in order for us to have harmonious relationships in church and by extension in our families and our workplaces, we need to behave with godly wisdom, not with worldly wisdom. What does that mean? Look at verse 13. Who among you is wise and understanding? By his good conduct, he should show that his works are done in gentleness that comes from wisdom. We've seen James do this earlier in the letter. He basically sets a trap for his listeners, and then he springs it on them. Who among you is wise and understanding? And they're like, I'm wise, I'm understanding. And then James says, all right, you're wise, you're understanding? Then by your conduct, 
you should show it to the world. By your conduct, you should show that your works are done in gentleness that comes from wisdom. It's easy to be claimed to be full of wisdom and to be wise. James says, listen, you say you're wise, show me by your life. Show me by how you live. And James uses an adjective there that means beautiful. It describes something pleasing to the eye. Applied to people, it means beautiful by reason of purity of heart and life. Live your life in such a way that unbelievers are impressed by your behavior. Whether we know it or not, unbelievers watch us all the time. They're watching us. They study us from a distance. They pay attention to how we do things, to how we respond to circumstances. People that don't know Jesus are watching how you handle circumstances in life. Every day you're either drawing people toward Jesus or you're pushing people away from Jesus. I think it was Billy Graham's wife, Ruth Graham, that used to say, a saint is a person who makes it easy for someone to believe in Jesus. A saint is someone who makes it easy for another person to believe in Jesus. What a worthy goal for all of us. The word gentleness there in verse 14, is, uh, verse 13 is often translated as meekness. It's the same word that Jesus uses when he is teaching the people in the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. Um, it's the same word that he uses there. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit that Paul writes about in Galatians 5. And before you think wrongly, that word doesn't mean a weak, mild person who basically lets anyone and everyone run all over them. A meek person may be strong, but that meek person is completely submissive to God's Spirit. Moses was described as the meekest person on the face of the earth, but Moses was anything but a pushover. Jesus describes himself as meek, but the same Jesus powerfully confronted religious leaders, and he overturned tables in the temple. Used in this context, meekness means my power under God's control. James says that meekness comes from wisdom. And you look at that one at verse 17, it says that wisdom comes from above. That's not anything new to the listeners of that day and age. The Old Testament was full of ideas and thoughts where that wisdom comes from God. The Proverbs, the writer of Proverbs says the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. See, there's a wisdom that comes from God. And there's a wisdom that's worldly. And these two wisdoms are at odds with one another. And James is saying, if you truly want to be wise, the only way you're going to attain it is if you seek God and his truth. And down in verse 17, James lists seven marks of what godly wisdom looks like. Notice what he says. First thing he says is that godly wisdom is pure. Godly wisdom is pure. And he underscores the primacy of pure. Godly wisdom is first and foremost pure. Without pure, without purity, wisdom is not from above. The Greek word there might be translated unmixed or unalloyed or unattained by anything that's impure. It may point to moral purity, but in the context here, it especially means the sense of being free from any jealousy or selfish ambition. In other words, it's focusing on our own motives. If we seek wisdom simply so that we could lord it over others, if we seek wisdom so we could use it for our advantage or our power or our promotion, then James is saying that's not pure wisdom. That's not godly wisdom. Our motive for seeking wisdom or using wisdom always has to be God. Can you be glorified in this? And can I build a person up to whom I'm dealing with? Can I use the wisdom where I can encourage and build this person up? You know, we need to keep that in mind, especially when we get into disputes with anyone. It's easy to want to win an argument, but you can win an argument and destroy a relationship. You can win an argument and destroy a friendship, or you can prove that you are right, and you can look good but doing it, and you can excuse your pride by telling yourself that what you're doing is right because you're standing for truth. Can I encourage you, before you jump into any dispute, you should pause and ask yourself, is, is this issue important in light of God's glory? And is this issue important enough that I could really hurt a relationship with this person that I'm talking to. 
Keep in mind Paul's words in his letters about not quarreling, about being kind, being patient, being gentle. And if it's a doctrinal or a deep moral issue, remember it takes time. And so you ask God to open that person's eyes and grant that person repentance. Your motives have to be pure or you're not acting in godly wisdom. Wisdom has to be pure. Secondly, wisdom has to be peace-loving. Purity is first, but then wisdom is peace-loving. In other words, if you compromise purity for the sake of peace, you're not acting in godly wisdom. But on the other hand, if you hold on to purity in a contentious or contagious manner, you're not displaying godly wisdom because wisdom is peace-loving. Seeking peace in relationships is not a minor theme in the Bible at all. The psalmist in Psalms 34 says, we must turn away from evil and do good. We must seek peace and pursue it. We're called to pursue peace. And those words apply to every relationship. We're to go after peace. Ephesians 4, Paul writes that we are to be diligent and persevere in the unity of the Spirit, in the bond of peace. Seek peace. Pursue it with diligence. Listen, if you're always stirring up controversy, especially controversy over petty issues, you're not acting in godly wisdom. If all you can think about is how you want to win an argument and prove yourself, you're not acting in godly wisdom. Listen, we should never compromise doctrinal purity on essential truth. Neither should we fight over minor matters where godly Bible-believing people differ. Godly wisdom is pure. Godly wisdom is peace-loving. The third thing James says in verse, seven is, in verse 17 is that godly wisdom is gentle. And that quality is hard to capture in one English word. It means gentle, non-combative, not quarrelsome, not easily annoyed. You discover this aspect of wisdom when you're under the gun, when you're exhausted and your temper is short, when you're worn out, when life overwhelms you and you seem to be barely swimming. How do you respond under pressure? When things get rough, when you snap, you lose. When you got to yell, you lose. When you have to threaten, you lose. And you need this kind of wisdom all the time. When you wake up late and you get on the highway and realize that there's a major traffic jam and you're not going to get to work on time. You need it, as Dominique was sharing over and over, when someone cuts you off in your, in your, when you're driving. You need it when someone starts yelling at you. You need it when you're dealing with difficult people. You need it when you're dealing with Christians who sin and with friends who disappoint you. You need it when you're raising rebellious children who just won't listen to you. See, if you believe in Jesus, you can be gentle. Why? Because he's been gentle with you. Aren't you grateful that Jesus doesn't deal with you according to what you deserve? Psalm 103 says he doesn't punish us for our sins. He doesn't deal harshly with us the way we deserve. See, if we got what we deserved, we would all end up in hell. We would not have God's grace and mercy on our lives because we have received mercy we can show mercy to others. And so we're called to remember what Jesus has done for us. And then we're called to go and do likewise. Godly wisdom is also reasonable. That quality may be easier to see when you flip it around. Earthly wisdom is arrogant. It's stubborn. It refuses to listen and has no desire to hear anyone else's opinion. A man like this dominates every conversation, every discussion. He uses sarcasm to put other people down, and he demands to be the center of attention in every room that he enters. He attacks anyone who attacks him because he has a fragile ego and a terrible temper. He's the master of the put-down and the one-liners. But godly wisdom doesn't look like that at all. 
The Greek word means easy to persuade. A person with this quality listens carefully because they want to know the truth. They want to know if they're off. They want to be corrected if they're going in the wrong direction. Don't mistake this for someone who's a pushover or someone that doesn't have any conviction. A persuadable person holds deep conviction without feeling the need to parade them around or constantly argue about them. He listens to people who he might disagree with because he believes that everyone has something to teach him. Can you disagree agreeably? Are you able to discuss your deep convictions without losing your temper, without getting mad? Can you listen kindly to someone who holds another position than you? I don't know about you, but as I was thinking through this text, this was more than ever, we need a revival of kindness in our nation. We are so quick to divide on anything and everything. You can't put a post on Facebook about something that you believe in without getting attacked. You can't read Facebook without seeing someone else's opinion, without having that urge to say, man, you're stupid. All right? I mean, you have, you have that urgency. You have that tendency to argue over anything and everything. We need a revival of kindness in our nation. The fifth thing that James says is that godly wisdom is full of mercy and good fruits. I don't know if you notice, but many of these qualities echo Jesus' teachings in Matthew 5, the Beatitudes, gentleness, purity, peace. It's also true of mercy. Jesus said in Matthew 5, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Jesus often underscored the importance of mercy. In Luke, he said, Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Being merciful means not only having compassion for a person who is suffering apart from anything wrong that he's done, it also means showing compassion to the person who's suffering because of his own fault. Shows mercy and compassion to the person who's suffering because of his own sin. Jesus was merciful to us in spite of the fact that we messed up our lives. Jesus was merciful and kind to us despite the fact that we caused our own suffering and our own hardships. And yet while we were sinners, yet sinners, the Bible says that Christ died for us. And he says we are to extend that mercy that we have received to other undeserving sinners. And James adds those words, good fruits. And James is harking back to what he talks about in James 2, that our faith has to show itself in practical deeds. If someone sees that you have that if, if you see someone in need and you offer nothing to help, James says, what good is that? What difference does that make that if you know they have a need but you don't help, what difference are you making? In other words, godly wisdom is not just theoretical. It's not something you sit around and talk about. It's practical. It rolls up its sleeves. It takes action. It loves those around them. Number six, godly wisdom is unwavering. This particular Greek word is only used here in the Greek, in the entire New Testament. It means holding firm to the same standard every time. Such a person is free from prejudice and favoritism. I don't know if there's any other baseball fans here, but I grew up loving baseball. I was a diehard Phillies fan and would watch every single game. Now I don't have time to watch 180 games or 60 games. It's just way too much. But, uh, but in baseball, you have an umpire that stands behind the catcher. And the responsibility of that umpire is when the pitcher throws the ball, there is a zone where, it's called the strike zone, where he determines that that ball was hittable, and if the ball batter decides not to hit it, it could be a strike. If it was a bad pitch, it would be a ball, right? And that umpire, that's his opinion on whether it was a strike or not. Sometimes he might give a little flexibility and say, the strike zone is a little bit outside of the, uh, of the strike zone, and so he might be a little bit out, and he'll call it a strike. Hopefully I'm making sense to you guys here. Um, and so he pitches, um, and so sometimes you'll see pitchers get mad. We're like, man, that was a strike, and he called it a ball. Or that was, and batters get mad. We're like, that was a ball, and you called it a strike. Oftentimes, managers will not get upset as long as the umpire is consistent. If the strike zone is the same, regardless of who's batting, regardless of who's pitching, 
If both sides gets the same call, you could say that the empire is impartial. He's not favoring one team or another. Apply that to our spiritual life. It means you tell the truth the first time. It means that when you're with group A, you don't tell one story, and then all of a sudden you're with group B, you change your story around. It means that how you act here is how you act out there. It means that the vocabulary that you use in the context of believers is the vocabulary you use in the context of non-believers. It means that the grace that you show to people that you like is the grace that you show to people that you don't like. It means that you don't waver based on who you're interacting with. Your life is consistent. It's unwavering. You're the same in public versus private. And finally, James says that godly wisdom is sincere. It's without hypocrisy. That word originally means not playing a part. It was used for the ancient Greek actors that would often wear a mask pretending to be someone else. One actor in a Greek play might play several parts, and so he'll put one mask on and then go to the back and change a mask and come back out as a different person. That's fine in theater. It's deadly in real life. To be without hypocrisy means that what you see is what you get. You're not two-faced. When you speak, people don't have to ask, I wonder what he really means. See, if we all lived by these seven qualities, personal conflicts would be greatly minimized and harmonious relationships would blossom and grow. But the problem is we all battle with the world, the flesh, and the devil. These focus, these forces combine to lead us astray into worldly wisdom which causes disharmony in all of our relationships. James in our passage also speaks about worldly wisdom and actually talks about five negative marks of worldly wisdom. Five things to show you that you're not living in a way that honors Jesus. Number one, he says, worldly wisdom is rooted in bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in verse 13. Verse 14. James mentions two negative traits twice. He mentions it in verse 14 and 16. They deal with the motive, the ambitions of our heart. Jealousy, some of your translations says envy, refers to resentfulness because others have something you want. It might be money, it might be title, it might be popularity, it might be a better job, it might be financial security, it might be a happier family. But do you suffer from envy? Do you secretly regret your friends when they succeed in places that you've not? Do you believe that you could have done better if you just had a few breaks here and there? Do you have a hard time believing that others just might have more talent and work harder than you do? Do you temper every compliment you give with the word, but? Hey, you did a great job today, but, right? Is that you? Do you complain that others don't often appreciate you the way they should? Do you walk away or avoid someone rather than celebrate with them when they received a blessing. When someone shows you kindness, do you question their motives? Do you have trouble rejoicing when someone else gets a promotion or someone else succeeds? Do you secretly gloat or rejoice when you see someone suffering? Do you find yourself more prone to offering criticism instead of compliments or encouragement? Those are some hard questions. But that's not the end of it. James says that jealousy leads to selfish ambition. The word originally meant gaining an office by a dishonest means. It describes someone whose desire gets to get them ahead, that they, lead, they will abandon all morality, break every rule, do whatever it takes to get ahead. And here comes the tricky part. James says the problem starts with the inside. We can harbor envy or jealousy while we're up here singing on the worship team. We can harbor envy or jealousy in our small groups, our 
while we're serving on hospitality, while we're teaching our kids, maybe even when you're standing here and preaching. To harbor means to give something a safe place to stay. Because it's a problem of the heart, it's hard to spot. James 4 offers us this wise counsel, that this command that we need to take seriously. He says, above everything else, guard your heart. Guard your heart. And Jesus probably had this in mind when he said in Matthew 12 that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. These verses cut both ways. Whatever is on the inside will eventually come outside, whether it's good or whether it's bad. If you think angry thoughts, angry words, and angry actions will sure, be sure to follow. If you fill your mind with sexual fantasies, you will find a way to fulfill those desires eventually. If you dwell on your problems, they will soon overwhelm you. If you feel like a victim, pretty soon you'll become a victim. If you give way to worry, you won't be, don't be surprised if you can't sleep at night. If you focus on how others misunderstood you, you'll soon become angry and bitter. What goes in has to come out. Sooner or later, your thoughts translate into reality. You Not what you think you are, but what you think you are. Godly wisdom also is arrogant. The Greek there means basically stop being arrogant. That's easy to do, isn't it? I'm right, and those who disagree with me are either stupid or they're sinning. As Paul says, knowledge puffs up. You ought to study the Word of God and become knowledgeable in the things of God. You all should be able to know what you believe and be able to support it from Scripture. But you have to be on guard against pride so that sin doesn't creep in. If we start parading our knowledge or using it to put others in their place, we're not displaying godly wisdom. Godly wisdom also denies the truth, number three. Coupled with the previous trait, the sense here seems to be if a man is motivated by jealousy and personal ambition and gets up and arrogantly berates others and proclaims how much he knows, his actions are giving lie to the truth that he professes to be teaching. I think it goes even further than that. The worst lies you tell are the lies you tell yourself. Here's the ultimate narcissist. You can't be corrected because... You will not listen. You're so knowledgeable that no, you don't want to listen to anyone else. Your arrogance leads you to sin. The next thing James says, worldly wisdom is earthly, natural, demonic. Verse 15, this is not the wisdom that comes from above, but it's earthly, it's unspiritual, it's demonic. I read that verse, and I'll be honest, it's a scary verse. That's a scary passage. James reminds us that if we aren't careful in our determination to win an argument, we will end up doing the work of the devil. We'll do the devil's work. Note the translation there puts wisdom in parentheses. When we're angry and in a fighting mood, we'll say things and do things that seem wise to us because we're doing God's work, or so we think. We gossip. We criticize. We impute bad motives. We threaten to leave if we don't get our way. There's a wisdom that's earthly, meaning it comes from human reason, not from God. It's the my way or, or the highway approach that takes no prisoners, that crushes the opposition and then brushes it off by saying things like, I heard this recently, you can't make an omelet without crushing a few eggs. That wisdom is unspiritual which means it appeals to human reason and human emotions. When you're upset, you say things that you never would say otherwise. You justify unkindness by saying, they made me do it, or no, they didn't. You did that on your own. They just exposed the junk that was in you. They didn't make you do it. They just revealed the, the junk that Jesus wants to remove. But that's not the worst of it. James says that this wisdom comes from hell. This wisdom comes from hell. It's demonic because it's hissing from the pit. Satan loves a good fight because he can get normally polite people to forget their Christianity and their faith and treat others like dirt. 
as the accuser of the brother, and Satan loves to get sheep to throw manure at each other. And unfortunately with the church, he doesn't have to work very hard to do it. Final thing James says is that worldly wisdom results in disorder and every evil practice. The word disorder that's used there is the same word that Paul uses in Corinthians that says that God is not a conf- God of confusion. The same word, disorder or confusion, is bound to break out in churches where people pursue their own selfish concerns and cause division rather than the good of the church. You know, if you've been in church long enough, you know that Christians are not really, really good at fighting fair. We let small disagreements become major issues. We elevate secondary matters to the level of the deity of Jesus. Our bitter arguments eventually become more important than Jesus himself. And what happens is it puts an end to Christian peace. It causes the church from loving our community to turn inward because we're trying to fix ourselves. It destroys the work of God. It turns new believers away from the church. It dishonors Jesus. It grieves the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't matter how right you are, bitter arguments stirs up sinful tendencies on every side. It causes weak Christians to give up on the church. It forces people to take sides on things that Scripture doesn't even say is important. It injures the testimony of the church. It confirms to the skeptics out there that the church is actually really, really full of hypocrites. It causes the enemies of the gospel to rejoice. And it sends a message to the world that, hey, God loves you, but in here we hate each other. And in the end, These things destroy the church. Bitter envy, selfish ambition are kind of a heart disease that destroys the body of Christ from the inside out. And what happens when envy combines with selfish ambition in the local church? The first thing that happens is you have disorder. Other translation will use words like confusion or chaos or disharmony or insurrection. You you and I know that Satan loves to stir up trouble, so it's no surprise that these devilish sins are present, that the church is in a constant state of turmoil. You fight, you fuss, you fume, you gossip, you disagree disagreeably, and you're ready to believe the worst, and the work of God comes to a grinding halt. And that leads to evil practice. Because the Bible calls the church the body of Jesus. When any part gets sick, the whole body gets sick. Think about it. If there's trouble up here on the worship team, it will lead to trouble in our community groups, which will lead to trouble in children's church, which will lead trouble to on the elder board. Just as disease makes a whole person sick, pretty soon, if we're not careful, strife in the church will make the whole church sick. If you stand back and look at these three verses, 14, 15, and 16, you'll see a clear progression there. Verse 14, what starts as wrong attitudes leads to, in verse 15, actions that are unspiritual, earthly, and devilish, which leads to, in verse 16, that causes the church to plunge into disorder and widespread spiritual sickness. Godly wisdom is pure. It's peace-loving, it's gentle, it's reasonable, it's full of mercy, it's unwavering, it's sincere, but worldly wisdom is full of bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, arrogant, denies the truth, earthly, unspiritual, demonic, creates disorder, evil practices. Look at verse 18. Verse 18 concludes by telling us what happens when we choose to live with godly wisdom. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace, by those who make peace. Anger produces a harvest. So does peace. But they're not the same. Anger produces a harvest of violence and hatred, and yet peace produces a harvest of righteousness, Scripture says. It produces a harvest of mercy, of love, of kindness, of forgiveness, of healing, of reconciliation. If we sow division, you will reap 
the harvest of hatred. If you sow peace, you will reap a harvest of righteousness. And living this way is not easy because peacemakers are often misunderstood. Sometimes peacemakers are attacked on every side. You will rarely win the applause from the world because the world loves a good fight. Controversy sells. Bad news always crowds out good news. But this is the best way to live because when you live like this, regardless of what the world thinks about you, you get God's approval. God says, I approve. By the way, I pray that you don't leave here this morning saying, going along, leaving here saying, I need to try harder. Because that's not the point of this text at all. Remember, verse 17 says that this wisdom comes from above. That means you can't work it up by trying harder. Living like this demands God's grace in your life. If he doesn't help you, you will descend into a dark pit of violence, greed, hatred, malice, and backbiting. And James gives us a key word in verse 18 when he uses the word seed. You parents, every day you're sowing seeds through the steady toil of raising your children by pouring into them. Missionaries on the mission field are sowing seeds of love as they share Christ with others. You sow seeds of peace when you spend time in prayer instead of writing off an angry email to that person that offended you. You sow seeds of peace by being hospitable and greeting one another and going to a new person and welcoming them and greeting them. You sow seeds by loving your enemies and doing good to them. You sow good seeds when you decide that you're not going to pass along a rumor that you just heard. You sow seeds when you decide that you're not going to argue politics on Facebook 24-7. And in a very deep sense, you sow seeds of peace by being faithful to God day in and day out, one day at a time. You know, no farmer sits around doing nothing all year long and then walks into his field and we're like, wow, look at that beautiful harvest. If there was a harvest, it's in part because he's worked hard to cultivate that harvest. If you see a church where there's peace, if you see a home where there's peace, it's because members have worked hard to cultivate peace. You've listened to one another. You've respected one another. You've judged your own selfishness and pride, and you sought to live in accordance to godly wisdom, not worldly wisdom. And it all takes time. You plant, you water, and then what do you do? You wait, and you wait, and you wait. It may be, take a long time. Sometimes there's tears that are involved. Psalms 126 says, if you go out in weeping, bearing the seeds of sowing, you shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing the harvest with you. You need to be patient. Some of you are dealing with people that have got you to your rope's end. But you need to be patient for your sake and for Jesus' sake. Because like we share week in and week out, God has intentionally put you into the lives of people that might not know Jesus because through you, Jesus would be seen through them. Some of you have family members that are difficult, that are hard and challenging. Can I encourage you to lean on godly wisdom as you build relationships with them? As we come to communion this morning, to the table that represents the death of our precious Savior, can I invite you to fall on your faces before God to confess your own sin. This table reminds us that none of us in this room are guiltless. It reminds us that none of us in this room are free from envy, that we all have secret ambitions, that we all harbor resentment, that at this table we're confronted with the fact that we are such great sinners that Christ had to die for us. We're all messed up to one degree or another. In our best moments, we are like sheep that have gone astray, that we've turned and run from Jesus. About 500 years ago, Martin Luther 
posted on the walls of the church in Germany, 95 theses of things that he wanted to see changes on the church. And the first thing that he wrote in that thesis was, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ says repent, he intended that to be the entire life of believers should be a life of repentance. See, you and I, we make a mistake if we assume that repentance is a one-time thing that we do when we trust Jesus. All of us need to have daily repentance because all of us sin every single day. We have to go back to the blood of Jesus again and again, claiming the merit of our crucified Savior as the ground of our forgiveness and our only hope of salvation. When James warns about worldly wisdom that destroys Christian unity, he's not asking us to point the finger at other people. He's saying, look in the mirror first and foremost. Consider your own heart. And then take the log out of your eye. You can't fix someone else, but you can change how you respond. 30 years after Luther posted those 95 theses, he scribbled his final words on a scrap of piece of paper, and he said, we're all beggars. It's true. We're all beggars. It's true. See, that's bad news for the proud person. But that's good news for the humble. You could heal almost any division if beggars would meet at the foot of the cross and cry out to Jesus for help. The call is both individual and personal. When beggars come in to repentance, they're healed by the blood of Jesus. Jesus revealed the problem and the solution when he says in John 15, he says, without me, you can do nothing. You will never be the right kind of man or woman without the help of Jesus. It's more than just following the example. You must come to him, bow before him, and cry out to him for mercy and forgiveness for the strength we need. Without Jesus, we will fight and bite and destroy each other. That's what Jesus, that's what James is telling us. Would you take a moment this morning to look in the mirror of your own heart and see what it's producing? Is your life producing those traits that display godly wisdom? Or is the Holy Spirit convicting you of things in your life that are more worldly. If you need someone to pray with this morning, David and Amanda are in the back. They're available to pray with you before you come to communion. Can I also say, if you're not a follower of Jesus this morning, I'm so grateful you're here. You're not here by accident. I believe Jesus drew you in here this morning. If you don't know Jesus, maybe the Holy Spirit is doing something in your heart Would you respond? Would you leave here this morning responding to Jesus and responding to his love for you? If you are a follower of Jesus, this table is open for you. And I invite you to come and partake and remember what Jesus did so that you could be a part of his family. When you're ready this morning, would you meditate on the words of this sermon as this worship team sings, and whenever you're ready, I invite you to come down the middle aisles, grab the elements, and go down through the side aisles, and just partake of communion, remembering the finished work of Jesus, so that you and I can be a part of his family. We're such great sinners that Christ had to die for us, but we're such sinners that Christ himself died for us. You're loved. Regardless of how much you've messed up or screwed up this week, Christ loves you. He draws you. He calls you. Would you respond this morning? Let's worship.